In this video lecture, we're going to talk about elements of digital media. What is digital media? And what are the things that you can use to identify digital media? What do you need to know about it? We need to define digital media, but before we do that, let's back up and define just media in general. This word media is a communication channel. It's the way that in news and entertainment, education data, promotional messages, anything at all that has written or visual or audio content that contains a message gets to you. So it's the means by which, the method by which information gets transferred from one person or a broadcaster, a transmitter of some kind, to you. So for example, TV is a medium, newspapers are media, books are media, websites are media, uh, radio stations, XM radio, these are all media. We also define media as data storage material. So not only are we are talking about ways and means of transmitting information, but ways of storing information. So that's what we mean by digital media, or just media generally. Digital media in particular is about encoded, eh, media that is encoded in machine readable formats. So we humans have design, designed all sorts of machines to do work for us. The information in those machines cannot be read the way it does by humans. I mean, we are you know, biological machines of some sort, but at the same time, the machines we create, they don't work on spoken language. They don't work on uh, written language. They work on their own logic inside, whether it be gears or computer code. Digital media is also media that is manipulated, created, distributed, saved, consumed via electronic devices. So anything that comes across via an electronic device is digital media. So it has like just a couple of examples of digital media. We've got YouTube, audio and video. We've got audio files. We've got electronic images. We also have just programs. The programs upon which you can manipulate and create and remix any sort of uh, visual, audio, what have you, those things are also digital media. TV programs, those are digital media. Websites, definitely digital media. Databases of sorts like this, these are digital media. Anything, that, again, that you can uh, encode in a machine-readable format and mess with electronically, whether it is a means of communication or a means of information storage, that is digital media. There are a couple of important features of digital media you need to know about. The first one is aesthetics. The aesthetics of digital media, they are skeuomorphic and or they are borrowed from the history of storytelling, contemporary cinema, TV, things like that. You may be wondering what does this mean? So let's break it down first and define aesthetics. Aesthetics is, you can think of it as a simple way, the study of that which is beautiful. So what do we humans think is beautiful? Now, of course, that changes by person, that changes by culture, etc. But all the same, aesthetics is what is beautiful to people. So we, uh, we talk about digital media, we borrow the aesthetics of previous media. That's an idea called skeuomorphism. A skeuomorph, I'm going to read this to you, is a derivative object that retains ornamental design cues from structures that were inherent to the original. In other words, they make one new thing look like something old, or behave like something that is old. An example of skeuomorphism that you're very familiar with, no doubt, are these symbols up here. I just took a screen cap off of PowerPoint. What do these three things we see here? On the left, we see a piece of paper. On the middle, we see a uh, file folder. And on the right, you have this symbol. Uh, it's, a, it's a save symbol. It looks like sort of an H in a box with a cut-off corner. Well, that is because this is actually a skeuomorphic object. It is this thing here, a floppy disk. This is a three and a half inch physical device that we used to use. It held 1.44 megabytes of information, or megabytes of data, I should say, 1.44 megs, and that was a lot. So we would save on these things. So we had to figure out how to visually represent save. Everybody used these things until they did uh, hard drives. So, uh, hey, let's just use this symbol. Everybody knows what that is. That's why we now have this thing, and you may not recognize it, but it needs to make a whole lot of sense if it's a skeuomorph. So the point being that a lot of our media, our digital media, 
is borrowed from history. So borrowed images, borrowed formats, borrowed styles, uh, borrowed ways of presenting information. So history of uh, s storytelling and movies and TV. It's linear, generally speaking. We start at one point, move along, and at some other point. So when you start talking about designing materials, whether it's visual materials, audio materials, interactive materials, information designs, we follow the same uh, patterns that we have in the past. Digital media is also all about computing. The big thing is computing power is vital to digital media. Without computers, digital media cannot and will not exist. And telecommunications, very similarly. By telecommunications, we're defining it both as the companies that do telecom and the physical objects and materials that interconnect these, uh, the world and carry these messages. If you think about telecommunications, it's a relatively new thing in the history of humanity. The first uh, telecom was really the telegraph cables. And say the first transatlantic telegraph cables, those were laid in the 1800s. That's not so long ago if you consider how long humans have been around. So we have developed our digital media very, very quickly over the last couple hundred years. You're probably saying, okay, great. Uh, why does that matter? Here's the deal. Lots of information in our world is digital now. There is, matter of fact, bytes upon bytes, uh, petabytes of material data being created all the time. So what does that mean? Well, according to Marshall McLuhan, he's a Canadian fellow who worked in the study of communication. So if he was, if he were still alive today, and if he were at KSU, he'd be over in the School of Communications and Media. His big thing was, and everybody remembers him for this, the medium is the message. What does that mean? The medium is the means by which something is transmitted. So remember, media, media is plural, medium is singular. So the media carries its own message. Think about it this way. When you are watching this video, it is a video, right? What sort of values implicit in video are there? Hmm, well, there's interactive. I can make it go and make it stop. Uh, there is some sort of telepresence going on where uh, Dr. Arnett seems like he's sort of here talking to me. There also, it's a modern thing, right? What if I was delivering this to you, but instead of video, it was on a rolled up uh, scroll of parchment that you had to unroll and it had been hand lettered? Would this have the same sort of value to you as a video was, or a video does? Probably not. So the point here is that the medium is the message. The medium which carries the message itself is a message of some kind. That comes through in this cartoon. This is a famous one by R. Crumb. He's an uh, American cartoonist. What is this cartoon saying? This cartoon is saying that, look, the TV, it's hypnotizing the person. It is actually sucking out his brain. Just da, 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 da. Is that what you want to be? Is that how you want to live your life? The answer should be no. The thing is, we should not be passive consumers who are manipulated by media. Instead, we should be active people, active agents. We should construct our own lives rather than being manipulated by the media that we consume. So you're saying, okay, yeah, I, I get that, I get that, but what does this really mean for me? Why is this important? What do, what do, I, what do I need to do? How does this tie into the class? The answer is that to be an active and media savvy director of your own life, someone who's in charge of your own life, there are two questions that you need to answer. One of them is what are the factors that make digital media possible? And how do these factors change the shape of our lives? In the remaining slides in this presentation, we'll talk about answers to these two questions. We've got technical factors and cultural factors that go into making up uh, digital media. Let's we'll start with the technical factors. They are automation, databases, hypertexts, interactivity, and networks. The cultural factors are telepresence, variability, and virtuality. We'll discuss each of these in turn. First off, let's talk automation. What is it? An automated process that is controlled by a mechanical or electronic device that minimizes the presence of human labor. So robots, for example, these things 
our automated machines that start working without us. Now, we do need to have us to start them and fix them and keep them going. But at the same time, once they start running, we don't really need people involved. So, for example, we talked about algorithms already, right? When we start up an algorithm on a computer, it will run by itself until we tell it to shut down or until there is a instruction put in the algorithm that says, I must shut down now. So think about this. Where do you encounter automation in your daily life? I'll give you a couple of examples. One big example, anything online, you go shopping online, for example, at Amazon. When you type in something to Amazon, like, I want a, uh, I want a new pair of shoes, you type in shoes. Are there little elves behind the screen who take your words, run to Amazon, rifle through some cards, shoes, 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 ah, we need to show them pictures of shoes, and then put pictures of shoes on the screen for you? No, of course not. This is just an, a, uh, a series of algorithms. It's just a bunch of instructions running automatically behind the scenes. So, shopping on Amazon massively, massively automated. A more concrete example from the real world, these railroad crossing guards. Train comes, they come down, they keep you from dying. Does anyone have to stand there, look for the train and hit the button? No, it's automatic. It's a machine that does it for you. Speaking of machines that do things for you, thermostats. Thermostats can be totally electronic or they can actually be mechanical. This one here is an old example of a mechanical. So if you look at the little picture on the right, it says mercury glass ampoule is a sealed switch. Basically what happens is there is a little coil. It's pointed down at the bimetallic coil strip, moves by temperature change and moves ampoule. It's set temperature, mercury tips to open or close contact. That's what it does. So that little roll of metal down there, it expands or contracts depending if it's hot or cold. It then moves and that bubble of mercury slides from one end of the bottle to the other. If it slides on one end, it doesn't do anything. If it slides to the other end, two electrical contacts touch, bzz, there it goes, it turns things on. This is automation. How about chat bots? You ever gone online and started doing a chat, like a support chat? Odds are, many of these things that you go online to talk to quote unquote agents, like I'm gonna to talk to the person at Comcast, you may not actually be talking to a person. You may well be talking to a chat bot. This is automation. Let's talk databases. What is a database? It's a structured collection of data. That is a basic meaning. There are all sorts of things that are databases. These things can be electronic, or they can also be paper-based. That's right, the humble filing cabinet. You've probably seen these things before. If you, if you think about it, what is a filing cabinet except a structured collection of data? This is all sorts of just pieces of data put together, stuffed in folders, and filed away. If it's done correctly, if, if it's something that is not just randomly crammed in, then it is meaningful, it's highly meaningful. I can go and look in specific places, find specific pieces of information that I want, pull them out, and make new information. So a database can be paper-based. There are also, though, often, especially in our times now, these things are digital. A digital database needs to do three things. One of them is store data. You gotta be able to take data put it somewhere so it stays there. You have to be able to read and write to it. Speaking of reading, retrieving data. So you put it in and you pull it out. You also then need to be able to access programs, take that data, give it to programs that will filter it and create new information. A digital database is, uh, these things are the backbone of our modern internet. They provide us almost infinite set of possibilities for, for taking information, com or taking data, comparing it to each other, combining it, and coming up with new and valuable information that no one would have been able to do before 
because perhaps there is too much data to sort through by hand. There is uh, data is too far removed, like one piece is way over there on the other side of the world, one piece is here. Perhaps I can get it now without having to travel all the way across the world. Its databases are amazing. One common database that we used to use, and you probably haven't seen much, is a library card catalog. I'm going to show you this YouTube video and I'm actually going to put it on a bit of a fast forward because it's created for children and the fellow speaks pretty slowly, but let's play this. Recently, I was on vacation to the center. Bad. Recently, I was on vacation to the center of the United States. You might think that was in Kansas or Nebraska, but no. The center of the 50 states of America is in Belfast, South Dakota. I was really bored. and I didn't know what to do. and I was just sitting around the house, just killing time. And then I had this great idea. Hey, I know what I'll do. Put on my sunglasses and walked across the street to visit the Belfouche Public Library. And when I walked in the doors, I found something that I haven't seen in many, 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 many years. A card catalog. A true card catalog. A card catalog is basically um, a record-keeping system of what the library has. And each book has its own card, and it also has a, a, an author card where you can look up books by an author's last name. Well, anyway, I went to the library, and as I was looking at this and taking some pictures of it, I thought, okay, what about, let's take a look about uh, Gary Paulson. So you can pull out the files, and you can look at the cards individually. Now, you see those little circles right there? Those, that's a rod that's going through the cards, so the cards can't be taken out. So I was looking up Gary Paulson, and you can see this is kind of what the cards look like. And then I decided, I wonder if they have Gary Paulson's book, Hatchet. And so we see here that his books are listed, and let's see. And here we go. Here's Hatchet. So I found Hatchet in the information, and I went to the shelf, and lo and behold, there was Gary Paulson's great book, Hatchet. So when you get your book, you take it to the counter, and you open it up, and there's a card inside. And what they do is, you show them your library card and tell them your name, and they write your library card number on the line and stamp the due date, which I haven't seen in a long time. Then, they take that card, and they put it within this filing system that was just amazing looking. They have all the cards arranged by the days in which... Um, the books are due. And so they have them that say if the book was due on the 15th, they put it behind um, the 15th. And so when they get the book back and they see the date that it was due, they can find that card number and pull the card and put it back in the book and reshelve it. All right. So that is what an old school paper database might look like. For in terms of a modern uh, electronic database, here's one that you probably have used or should use all the time, the KSU library. So the super search there, you type something in a book, article, ebook, video, by keyword, author, title, whatever it may be, boom, it'll go search databases and pull out the information and find it for you. This is really, really cool. So when I was a college student, if I wanted something, uh, this is, uh, we were just getting out of card catalogs when I was one of you all. And I would have killed, killed <laughs> for the research tools like this that are available to you through databases. Hypertext. What is it? It's a system of clickable links in databases that let users navigate from one web page or one piece of content to another one. What do you think using the internet without hypertext would be like? It would be very interesting, wouldn't it? I'm not going to answer this question for you, but I want you to think about it. Interactivity. Interactivity is the potential for a user to influence the form of media. So in terms of interactivity, what does that, what does, what does that mean? What, what do you mean that can influence the form of activity? or influence the uh, media's form. Well, uh, I can manipulate sizes, colors, shapes, layouts. I can manipulate speeds, perhaps. I can do all sorts of interesting things. So, question for you to consider is, what interactive media do you use every day? Again, I'm not going to answer this for you, but consider it. What interactive media do you personally use every day. Networks. These are interactive links between multiple computing devices. 
These things are building blocks of an information society. If a computer is just sitting by itself, it's not plugged into the internet, it's just sort of a, a, a useful typewriter, if you would. It can do all sorts of really cool stuff, but you have to bring it hard disks, you have to bring it a jump drive, you have to do something, plug it in physically, pull off the information. Wow, a network, you don't have to do that. A network makes things fast and easy. It makes the ability to transfer information, data and information, so, so quickly, so easily. If you don't have a network, you can't really have an information society. A question for you. What digital networks can you think of? There are multiple ones. Think about this. I'm not going to answer it for you, but think about it. What are the digital networks that you can think of? Telepresence. Telepresence is a word you may not have heard before, but here's what it means. It means the experience of a person somehow being there by means of a communication medium. So, for example, I am talking to you direct, well, indirectly through a, uh, a video, a narrated video. There's some telepresence going on. I'm kind of there with you, but I'm not actually physically there with you. I'm just talking to you this way. The thing you see on the right there, that's like a little, uh, oh, what's the word for it? Uh, it's sort of a segue, but it has a video screen on it. So it's like the person is perhaps there in a meeting but not really there. Or if you have to navigate your way around the office, you can put this thing in, it'll roll around the office, you go up to Dave's desk and say, hey Dave, Sherelle here. I got a question for you. And that way you can talk directly, sort of face to face, without actually being in the office. A question for you. For what purposes would you, or anybody else, need telepresence? What's it good for? Why do we want telepresence. Why do we need to have it seem like somebody is actually there in person when they are not actually there in person? Consider this question. I'm not going to answer it for you, but consider it. Variability. This is a cultural term. It's related to the idea of technical interactivity. As we already talked about interactivity, we can, we can change things. So, in digital culture, then, variability means the easy modification of digital objects and related cultural formations. So digital objects, files of some kind, so pictures, sounds, whatever it may be. Cultural formations, similarly. Uh, things in culture that are not necessarily written down. They are, if you would, uh, sort of mimetic. They're ideas floating around. So with variability, we then can take these things that are floating and we can manipulate them. We can remix them. We can uh, add to them, subtract from them, all sorts. And we can do just about anything. We can vary the material, vary the content, and modify it to suit our own likes, wants, and needs. Question for you all. What are some examples of variable things in popular American culture? I'm not going to answer this for you. But I want you to think about it. What are some things that are variable in popular American culture? Virtuality. Virtuality is an interesting concept. It's actually pretty deep. The idea here is that objects or activities that quote unquote exist but are not actually reach are not, not real in the sense you can reach out and touch them. So they're not tangible, they are not concrete. That raises a couple of interesting questions. What does it mean to be virtual? And are virtual things real? These are pretty, uh, pretty fundamental questions. So when we talk about going online, are we actually doing anything real? Or is this just sort of a simulation? Is, is it a fakery? Uh, what does it mean to be virtual? Is it does it, does it count if you do something on a computer, or does it have to be in face-to-face, -face or have some sort of real-world effect, or is it, uh, does the virtual world have its own end, its own being? Uh, why, when we go online, let's say that you play video games and you win, does that mean anything? Did you actually win anything? 
So these are actually uh, fairly deep questions. I'm not going to answer them for you, but I want you to think about it. What does it mean to be virtual? And are virtual things actually real? If you like that little talk about virtuality, I got some ideas for you. Here's a fella. His name is Jean Baudrillard. He is a French philosopher. He died a while back. But one of his big things that he's famous for is a book called Simulacra and Simulation. The idea that he's getting at in this book is that our society, we've replaced reality and meaning with symbols and signs. So he is saying that there is a real thing out there somewhere, but in our modern, <laughs> the cliche, in our modern world, we have no longer, we have actually lost contact with what is real. Everything that we do in our society is just a fakery, a simulation of what is real. The, that thing that is the fakery, the simulacrum, it replaces the original object. Then, once that simulacrum has replaced the original object, then there is really no difference between reality and representation. And then originality just kind of goes out the window. So, for example, politics. What is politics? It's often called the, uh, what's the phrase? The art of the possible. That's what it is. So when we talk about doing something political, we are trying to somehow change the world or make people believe what we believe, have them go along with us, agree with us to take some sort of action. What does it mean, though, in our today's modern politics? Well, in America, generally speaking, we talk about the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. What do those things actually mean? Well, they are a series of planks, if you would. They are a series of slogans, of ideals. Does that actually have anything to do with changing people's lives? And Baudrillard would say, no, it doesn't. It's You've just substituted this institution for the actual action of working and talking to people and changing minds and trying to figure out what's real. Instead, we have two big organizations fighting each other, and we call that politics. So he, Baudrillard is saying that these virtual things, the virtuality has just taken over our entire world, even those things that are concrete and physical. So, if you like that, there's an introduction to Baudrillard. I'm just going to leave that be. You don't need to go any further with it, but I thought this was an interesting side trip into philosophy, and we went with it. The question then, why do designers and technical communicators need to know the stuff we've been talking about today? That's, you know what, that's a really good question. I'd like you to think up an answer. It might just, uh, you know, crop up on a test, or, uh, you know, maybe it's not. I might just be messing with your head and having you try to figure out why do designers and technical communicators like to know this, or need to know this stuff. Think about it. That's the end for today. So, thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, as always, please email me. Email address is jarnet11 at kennesaw.edu. Thanks very much.